in the end. Jet ski racing games are the one type of racing game you really don't see very often these days. The most recent example I can think of is Kandagawa Jet Girls. However, I don't want to talk about that game for reasons. But more specifically, it tends to combine water gun elements as you race, so it's not really a dedicated jet ski game. What I mean by the types we don't see are ones like Wave Race 64, Jet Moto, technically the sequel Wave, Wave Race Blue Storm, and the subject of today's video, Splashdown. Or rather, its sequel, Rides Gone Wild. The original Splashdown came out in late 2001 on the PS2 and was later ported to the Xbox in mid-2002. This was Rainbow Studios, known at the time for Motocross Madness and ATV Off-Road Fury. Uh, this was their first jump into water-based racing games, uh, pun intended. Splashdown was a surprise success, and combine that with the role Rainbow Studios was on, only three days after the original Splashdown was released, THQ agreed to acquire the studio in exchange for 1 million shares of common stock. The deal was finalized on January 3rd, 2002. Which led to the sequel being made under THQ. The original game was published by Infograms under the Atari name. Splashdown Rides Gone Wild was exclusively released on the PS2 on August 5th, 2003 for North America and October 17th, 2003 for Europe. An Xbox version was planned, but it was cancelled so the studio could solely focus on their next title, MX Unleashed. In fact, Black Label PS2 copies of MX Unleashed advertise Rides Gone Wild on the back of the manual, and vice versa. I never quite played the original Splashdown, but I always heard good things about the sequel thanks to one Mental Jesus Rocks, but despite his hidden gemming screwing up certain games prices, this one still remains affordable, which is a good thing because hot damn, this game is fun. Splashdown Rides Gone Wild has your standard bevy of racing modes of this type of game. You have your training mode, which will allow you to learn the game's mechanics, both basic and advanced. You also have Stunt Library, where you can practice every stunt in the game, more on stunts in a moment. Arcade Mode allows you to play on any unlocked course in the game, race or freestyle. The latter mode is just you going off ramps and performing stunts. You have to get the highest score within the time limit. You have power-ups that will fill your performance meter with boosts, speed up hold meter for a short time, uh, multiply stunt combo, extend time, and allow repeat stunts without penalty. Time trials are where you race against the clock for a best time. Technical time trials force you to stay within the buoys to set the lap record. There is nothing else but you and the buoys. You can also just practice freely on any course as well to learn it. You can also battle a friend in race, freestyle, technical time trials, and practice in the versus mode. The main mode of the game is career mode. The general formula remains the same as the previous game, according to the manual. But now there's a new career path. You have the main world championship mode, which will take you through the main eight courses over two series. Only the first four over one series if you play on rookie. New to this game is Stadium Championship. This path will take you down 12 courses across 3 series, 7 across 2 for Rookie Mode, and these will change the type of courses that you play on. The Stadium courses are pretty straightforward, and the World courses? Well, you'll see soon enough, my friends. The races play out the same regardless. Place in the race to keep moving on. If you don't place, you have to use a Continue. Like I said in my Burnout review, I hate limited continues, but unlike Burnout, where they are fixed there, here they depend on the difficulty you select and the path you take. World gives you 3, 4, and 2 continues respectively for Rookie, Pro, and All-Star. Stadium gives you 5, 6, and 2 continues for the same aforementioned difficulties. Plus, with the point system, more on that later, you're not capped off from unlocking stuff. You can save slash freeze your career if you have to stop, but when you load a frozen slash save career, the save is erased so you can't just keep reloading the race. But with the point system, this isn't really that much of an issue. The racing itself isn't much different from other games in the genre. You have a set number of laps and you race in a closed circuit track. 
The stadium courses are designed with more linear paths and ramps that you can perform stunts on. They do have nice designs. The objects that form the path look cool, and the stadium designs are nice. You've got your standard looking stuff, you've got a Roman Colosseum inspired one, and even one that is underwater like that one arena in Rocket League. The real show stealers of courses are the World Tour ones. These ones are inspired by theme park rides, hence the subtitle of the game. They have more shortcuts and well, they tend to change as you race. This leads to alternate routes opening up that you couldn't take before. Take the first course for example, Bermuda Blast. It starts off like Sunny Beach in Wave Race 64, right? But just when you think it's going to be a sunny day at the beach, your HUD starts flashing and the screen flashes white and the next thing you know, you're racing through a stormy abandoned and wrecked shipyard where World War II era planes are dogfighting. By the second lap, the pilots are down and you see them. By the third lap, they get abducted by a UFO X-Files style. It's very creative and the creativeness doesn't stop there. Then you have Dino Dominion, a Jurassic Park inspired course that has you go through this dinosaur themed attraction with all these animatronic dinos that by the last lap are breaking down and you see them exploding and they're just falling apart. The adjacent building you go into is flooding and, and it's all just very creative. There's also a Haunted Castle, a Western Gold Rush themed course. And there's even a flooded town where you race through a flooded high school and even on its football field. The creative juices were flowing on these courses. When you complete a race slash event, depending on how well you did slash how much tricks you did, you'll earn a certain number of points. These points can then be spent in the warehouse to unlock additional characters, outfits, jet ski skins, and a whole bunch of other bonuses. Normally as you play through the main modes, you'll unlock the courses this way as you progress. However, should you get stuck on a certain course and be unable to continue, you can just unlock them with the points you've earned so far. I love this. It provides an alternate way of unlocking stuff in case you can't quite get it down, and it doesn't cap your progression off in any way, shape, or form, unlike Burnout 1. Though you will want to beat the main modes, so you can use your points on other stuff to buy. Especially the extra skins for the more beachwear-like attire, which I prefer. Hint. Enter up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, square, circle on options to get 50,000 points at the start of the game for North American copies. You'll thank me later. So there's a lot to play around with here, right? But what's it all good for if the game it doesn't control well? Well, thankfully it does. Rides Gone Wild has multiple presets of control schemes to suit your playstyle, but the default one works fine enough. Controlling your jet ski is pretty simple, though it can feel a bit loose at times. I think this was somewhat intentional, not to mention mastering the physics as well. I should mention that those are pretty damn good and follow what you would expect. Depending on the wave height you jump off of, that will determine your height, and diving under enough can net you a big jump when you come out. So it's not just turning left and right, you can push forward and pull back and everything will adapt as you'd expect for a bit more strategy. Should you want to get more out of this, there is a simulation handling option as well. But for most people, the arcade style handling will be fine. The stunts are where things get a bit more interesting. There are two types of stunts, one with your jet ski, and the standard stuff you've seen in games like ATV Off-Road Fury and MX Unleashed. The first type, you hold down L2, and as you go off the ramp, you can move the stick left to right slash vice versa for a barrel roll. Or you can move it up to down, slash vice versa, for back and front flips, respectively. L1, R1, and R2 are your trick, normal, trick stunt buttons. As you come off the ramp, hold any of the three buttons mentioned one at a time while pushing the analog stick in one direction. You can then move it in a different direction while holding the trick button down to transition into another trick. These are broken up into tiers, so if you can get a third trick, you pretty much get a third tier. Uh, do one, land it successfully, and you'll max out your performance meter, which will auto-boost your jet ski. While it does work fine for the most part, trying to transition from one trick into another can be a pain, since if you don't have the right combo, your character will just be locked in a trick. So if it looks like I'm trying to get good shots of the ladies, I swear to you that's not intentional. 
Not that the camera helps with that. But it's me trying to figure out which direction the analog stick should be pushed in into the next direction in order to get the next trick. Otherwise, everything does work fine as it should, but be careful not to uh, miss a buoy there when you have no boost in your meter or your engine will stall. And also, flips and barrel rolls do feel a little clunky to pull off. Sometimes you also may accidentally do a helicopter spin as well when you don't intend to. The graphics are also pretty good. The game has a cartoony feeling to it, and boy do they go all out with it. Not just the courses themselves. Everything is colorful, vibrant, even on some darker courses, and everything is modeled well for the time. All the tracks have appropriate set pieces and props so nothing looks out of place, and the models for them are clear as possible. On top of that, the animations in general are pretty good. The characters share the over-the-top cartoony nature of it all between the animations on the character select screen and the trick animations which also look just insane as you probably couldn't pull some of them off in real life, so to see them here is just insane and it looks damn good as well. Character models are also pretty good. They have nice details and while they might not look too impressive by today's standards, they still are pleasant to look at, even if they want to jump out at you. You might drown without a life vest, so wear one, kids! Seriously, enough with the Wayne's World close-ups. Still, all looks good. The sound design is pretty good here as well. The music here depends on which tracks you race on. For all stadium and technical time trials, you get a licensed mix of rock songs here that was pretty standard for this era. Artists in featured include the Boss Martians, the Xyz, Soil Work, uh, the Donnas and Flames, and the two noteworthy songs from this bunch are Kazar's Pedal to the Metal, seen in Downhill Domination, another game I should probably review that's also turning 20 years old this year, and Audio Events The Energy, seen in Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure. In fact, playing this all those years ago and hearing that song in this game made me go back and rediscover Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure, so winning! It's a decent mix that fits these courses very well. The real standout music ties into the world courses. These have their own original compositions and are basically made to give you that grand adventure feeling. They have very John Williams-like motifs, so it feels like they came out of, say, Jurassic Park or Indiana Jones. And you'll get them probably stuck in your head. The sound effects work as well. The jet skis sound as they should, the waves will properly adjust depending on the type you ride on, and each track sound also fits the mood as well. The last course, especially on the World Tour, which is sort of like a James Bond style action set piece in Venice, you have all these explosions going off and all these other crazy action set pieces, and it all fits and sounds well, as do the sound designs for every other track. Environment sounds are fine, and the sound design on the whole is good. The voice acting is what it is. It has that same cheesy in your face attitude and part you see in these types of games. There aren't any instantly recognizable names from the voice cast, so again, it is what it is. Four actors come back from the last game, and most of them, with the exception of Gina Teal voicing newcomer Coral Soares, voice who they voiced in the last game. The returning vet Kyoko's voice actress from the last game, Angelica Frost, gets replaced by Eri Ikoma. Everyone else does a good job though, so it helps. One last thing, you can adjust the frequency of the dialogue. So if you don't want to be sounding like you're on Botchamania, quoting, you talk too much, you can adjust the frequency of the dialogue to, well, yeah. There's a lot of replayability here in addition to just best times and scores. Between the amount of content to unlock, there's four standard riders, plus their outfits and jet ski skins in addition to the default character's alternate skins, four special characters, a zombie, a caveman, a prospector, and a James Bond parody. All the tracks you don't get in career mode, all technical time trials should you not play them, ending videos for those you don't beat career mode on at least pro with, and should you find the hardest mode not that hard, there's an all-out mode that will really put you to the test. There's quite a bit to unpack here, and you might take some time to get it all. 
Splashdown Rides Gone Wild is a damn good game that controls well, looks well, has a good amount of content, sounds awesome. It's just a very creative game on the whole. And it's overall just a damn fun racing game that provides a grand adventure. And quite frankly, you don't even need to play the original Splashdown to enjoy this one. However, the AI can get a little reckless at times, the handling can feel loose, and the stunt controls can feel a bit clunky at times when chaining tricks. Still, these are only minor flaws and don't impede this otherwise awesome racer. I can recommend this game for those who want a Jukeetsuki game and can't find many modern options, or just an interesting racer, period. Despite being hidden gemmed by Metal Jesus Rocks, this game has still remained relatively affordable and goes for about $10 complete in box, and it's absolutely worth it at that price. And this is despite the fact that the planned PS4 digital re-release got cancelled, even though THQ Nordic intended to release it along with Stuntman Ignition. There's another one I can add to the potential review list. It was mentioned in an article back in uh, April of 2017 that they would get re-released digitally along with Red Faction 2, but only that got digitally re-released. I'm not sure why this one and Stuntman Ignition's uh, digital re-releases got cancelled. I really hope it's fixed at some point. And if not, just make like Hikikomori Media, make yourself a PS2 classic from a PS4 Pro, and slap this game on there. Regardless of how you play it, just play it at some point, because they really don't make them like this anymore. I give Splashdown Rides Gone Wild a 4.5 out of 5 with a badass seal of approval. Damn, I'm on a roll for fun games. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, click the big red button below to subscribe. Check out the other links in the description for more cool stuff. And check out the playlist on screen for more content. See you in the next video.